I'm going to read the NIV Isaiah chapter uh, four or Hosea chapter 14. Um, I've got some bullet points at the top, and what we're going to see here is hope, hope for uh, Israel's future. Now, when we talk about hope for Israel's future, we do need to identify this: uh, 722 BC is going to be the Assyrian dispersion. That is has never ended that that we're still waiting for that restoration just because you've got here judah going into babylonian captivity uh in in, in, uh, in 590 or 580 86 and then coming back after that in the days of cyrus uh they come back and then they rebuild the temple then they're in progress while Jesus is on, on earth, and then in 70 AD, they're dispersed again. So understand, this return from capti the Babylonian captivity, really, I mean, you can think about it, but this is no, by no means talking about Judah going into captivity and then <coughs> returning, because when they returned, they still had the same heart problem. They still had hard hearts they still could not understand what we're waiting for is the cross we're waiting for the messiah and so when a northern israel goes into captivity or dispersion in 722 they have never recovered when we talk about hope for the future that's not a hope of returning from exile jeremiah spoke of that you'll be in exile for 70 years and then you'll return but that wasn't the new covenant jeremiah spoke about he was still talking about a distant future so Judah going into captivity, returning, they just got set up to go back into dispersion again. So we've got, in a sense, the Assyrian dispersion of 722 still out there, and the Roman dispersion of 70 AD, when all Israel's been cast out, and we're waiting for this restoration. So any time of hope, and the reason that has to be true is the theme throughout this book, as in the Old Testament, is again the hearts of the people. God is going to say, repent. He's going to say, return. But he's also going to say, you cannot. It, it's not in your nature. You don't have the ability. Anytime they return, it would just be for a moment. It would just be like he talks about, you know, do. It would be there for a moment and their faithfulness is gone. There's going to have to be a change. A change in the human heart. A change in the human nature. Uh, there's got to be a real payment for the sin. There can't just be forgiveness. There's got to be a payment for the sin. There's got to be a change in this heart. And they, need, they need new life. They need the life of God. They need to be born again. And we looked at that last week. Some verses that were hinting towards they can't even be, they can't even be born in, the, in this chapter. They need, they're waiting. That's what Jesus was talking about. So they're waiting for, in a sense, the Messiah. They're waiting for the seed of the woman. And it's really not radical. I mean, the whole Bible pivots on that very concept. We're going to see a word tonight. The word is healed. And that right there is a clear indication of they need to be healed. If, if someone is, has to be healed, that means they're broken. They can't do it themselves. Before they can make any kind of an effort, they need to be healed. This is really a, a word, Jesus uses it, but it's a word that indicates they're broken and they can't do anything about it. Before they can come to the Lord, they need to be healed. And they can't heal themselves. And so that is a very important word, captures the very idea that they're waiting for this salvation. And so we, we can see that throughout here. It is, is, is uh, talks of hope, and it talks about the day when they do come back, because the Lord is going to heal them and bring them back, that there's going to be tremendous, we'll just say, growth. And the, the thing you're going to see in here is the image of plants and trees and flowers uh, fruits growing grain and it's going to be very productive meaning this kind of picks up with I've got the verse typed in there in John 15 when Jesus says and I think you know we talk about where Jesus got his his teaching from obviously he's the son of God he can bring fresh revelation but he's explaining the Old Testament and this is one of those examples which John Jesus says you know I am the vine you are the branches without me you can do nothing is this is where they're finally going to be in the, in the future here when they have that hope returned to them they're going to be able to produce tremendous growth because they're going to be plugged into God himself and they're going to produce this fruit 
And uh, that is, you know, it could be. I mean, again, the theme is consistent, so it's not unusual that Hosea and Jesus would say similar things. But Jesus could be building on Hosea's image here of them being healed and then being plugged in and then producing this growth. So here is NIV chapter 14, uh, the final chapter of Hosea. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. And the Lord is capitalized, so it's Yahweh, all four capital letters. Your sins have been your downfall or guilt. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. And again, I'm going to, we'll look at those words again in the English Standard Version and you've got the Hebrew on your, on your notes. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never say again our gods to what our hands have made for in you the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. There's the Lord speaking. For my anger has turned away from them. Three things are said there. Now here comes the fruitful part. I will be like dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again in his shade. He will flourish like the grain. He will blossom like a vine. And his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. O Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? Again, that's their problem. I will answer him and care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. And here's the closing verse. Uh, who is wise? He will realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The way of the Lord, the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. I mean, kind of being said right here. Here's the truth. If you're wise, you're keeping up. You're processing this. If the Spirit of God is with you, if you're born again, if you have the Spirit of God in you, if you walking with God, you'll understand these things. Now, if you're rebellious and you're trying to work your own way, maybe you're trying to walk along with the Christians, you're trying to you know, walk around with the church, uh, you, you don't understand these things and you'll end up continuing in your rebellion even though you try to understand them. So that's the NIV. I wouldn't mind reading, uh, I'll just read the bold words on the notes, which is the English Standard Version. And something that I'd point out as we go by is when it says, the trees of Lebanon, and I can, you can see it in the Hebrew when we go by, the, the text of the Hebrew. It does not say anything about the trees of Lebanon. It just says Lebanon. And that, just keep that in mind. It, it, you know, Lebanon is known for the, the cedar trees, and especially when it talks about the fragrance. It sounds like it's talking about the trees of Lebanon, but it does not say that. Another thing that is interesting here, um, in verse... Uh, um, uh, yeah, verse, chapter 14, verse 7, in the English, if I see in uh, the NIV, it says, men will dwell again in his shade. And that's what the Hebrew says, his shade. But the, the English Standard Version here says, my shade. And the difference there is this. His shade is Israel. My shade is Yahweh. Now, of course, you want to side with this one right away because, well, we want to give glory to God. But again, you, you've got two different tra good translations going two different ways. But understand the context here. The context is the Lord is the dew that's causing the growth. And Israel's like a tree. It's like an olive tree. It's like a flower. It's like the grain. It's blossoming. It's growing. So what is growing here in these verses is the nation of Israel. And that's what the text says. It says, his shade, referring to Israel. And then you're going to have underneath that, you're going to have the word they, they, they. Or it says it three times. Or it's men. And they are dwelling in the shade of this nation of Israel. Which could be individual Israelites are now prospering in their nation 
that's plugged into the Lord, or the men can pick up on the whole concept that throughout Isaiah and the prophets, the Gentiles. Israel will be established again as a nation, and all the men, including individual Israelites, but also the world, the men, uh, the, the nations are blessed because they're dwelling in the shade. Not to uh, cast shade on Yahweh here, but that is really not the context here that Yahweh is dwelling because Yahweh is the dew that's causing the tree to grow. The tree's got the shade and the individuals, either individual Israelites or the Gentiles are coming and they themselves are prospering and also growing in the shade of this tree who's plugged in the Lord. So that's something as you go by, you can kind of think about that. Um, so here we go. I'm going to read it again. Chapter 14, verse 1 on page 1 of the notes. I'm just reading the bold English Standard Translation. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to Him, Take away my all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. I'll explain that. Uh, verse 3. Assyria shall not... Now here's three things that are, they've given up hope on. Assyria shall not save us. Internet na nation. They're always trusting Egypt or the international community. We're going to have some kind of peace treaty. Israel, or Assyria is not going to save us. We will not ride on horses. That would be their own military strength. Horses won't. The nations won't save us. Our own military, our own strength won't save us. And we will say no more, our God, to the works of our hands. Mainly idols, but it could also refer to the sacrifices they're making. We don't hope in the nations. We don't hope in our national military. We don't even hope in the things we do. If it be build an idol or offer a sacrifice. In you, the orphan finds mercy. In other words, we have no family. We're alone. Our only hope is if you do something. It's not Assyria. It's not our strength. It's not our works. In fact, we don't even have a family. Only the Lord can help us. Verse 4, I will heal. Key word right there. I will heal their apostasy. Again, I'm going to come back and teach this, but as we go by this, I will heal their apostasy. Uh, you can't expect, in this context here, for someone who is in apostasy, backslidden, fallen away, well, you need to come back. You need to come back. The only way they're going to get come back is that apostasy needs to be healed. That's the work of God, the Lord, the Spirit. When that apostasy is healed, well, now they're in the life of God. So, again, again people need to be responsible. Christians need to be responsible. But the actual original problem is you can't fix it. You have apostasy. You need to be healed of it. The Lord will heal their apostasy, which then means there's going to be a work of salvation. God is going to do this work sometime in the future. And in, in the days, it's in the future in Hosea's day. And I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I mean, again, turn from them, what does that mean? He's just been, I, I, I've been mad long enough. Well, God, God is eternal. If he's angry, he's angry forever. It's not like, you know, a dad. You know, when I was a dad, I'd get mad at the kids or something. And after a couple hours, okay, I've been mad long enough. You've suffered my wrath long enough. I'll, you know, I'm, I'm over it. Again, that's inconsistent parenting. We, we talk to our, our boys about consistent parenting. You know, be careful when you set that ground rule. You know, it's like, well, we're going to make this rule. Okay, be careful when you make a rule because the first one that's going to falter on that rule is the parent because I'm just tired of enforcing the rule. As a teacher, I got school starting on Thursday, and the same thing is you just kind of get ready. Here comes a bunch of middle school kids. We're not going to make a bunch of rules because if I make a bunch of rules, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to get tired of enforcing the rules and I'm going to present myself as weak and unfocused. So very, very few rules, very simple, something I can say. I've got to stay focused on it until May or June or unless COVID breaks out until the middle of next week. But nonetheless, you know, when I make a rule, I can't take my eye off of it. And so the same thing here is when it says, for my anger has turned from them, it's not that God just got tired of being angry. Something has happened that has taken care. His anger is gone, which again is the cross. All that. Heal, love freely, anger has been turned away. That's all the cross. Chapter 14, verse 5. I'll be like, the, here it is, I will be like, Yahweh will be like the dew to Israel. It all begins, he's the dew. That's the moisture. That's the water. That's going to cause the growth. And here comes a whole flurry of illustrations of what Israel's going to be like once they're healed, once God loves them, 
unconditionally, and once his anger is turned away and he becomes dew and they begin to grow, here it is. He shall blossom like the lily, that would be Israel. And the word lily, it means flower. Again, we're not sure what flower that would be. There's ideas. Lily's good, it's close. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. Once again, you can see in the Hebrew there, the word trees has been added. Uh, it's on page 3. Uh, the Hebrew says, I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. See, there's no tree in there. And again, it's almost like, obviously, roots, Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon. And then it continues, chapter 14, verse 6. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive, and his fragrance like Lebanon. There again, it's just Lebanon. But there you see shoots, that would be branches, new branches. Uh, beauty like the olive tree, and that's olive is everything that has from oil to food to prosperity to wealth. And his fragrance like Lebanon, we'll talk about that. They shall return and dwell beneath, there's the word, my shadow. They shall return and dwell beneath his shadow. Now, whose shadow? Probably, the, well, the, where's the, the trees? Where's the shadow? It's coming from the plants that are growing. It's Israel. It could be Yahweh. You've got to decide. They, they shall return and dwell beneath his shadow. They shall flourish like grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. And then here's the last two verses. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress from whom comes your fruit. And then the last verse, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. In other words, if you're wise, if you're discerning, you have permission to this all makes sense to you. You understand this? Yeah, you're discerning, you're wise. You've been born again. You've got the spirit. Uh, for the upright walk in them. In other words, you are upright and you're going to begin to walk in these things. Well, what about those that don't understand? Uh, the transgressors will stumble in them. They'll misinterpret them. They'll misexplain them. They'll misapply them. They'll just stumble in these things. Almost like Jesus all of a sudden speaking in parables, kind of counting on a verse like this. He speaks parables. They say, the people don't understand what you're saying. He says, yes, they do. Those who have more will be given. Those who don't have, even what they have, they're going to start to stumble and lose it. It's going to be taken from them. So it's kind of like if, you, if you're here, you understand what's going on. If you're not understanding, well, that's because you are not discerning. Okay, uh, here we go. I'm going back to page one of the notes. And again, it's pretty straightforward. I've covered a lot of things already. The first verse, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. This is the beginning of the hope, is there's going to be a return. And, of course, he's been telling them to return, but the whole point is they can't. They do not have the ability to return. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. And, again, the word iniquity can be the word guilt, their, their disobedience. The reason they've been disobedient, the reason they are stumbling, is they are guilty. They've got sin, and they can't do anything. Their sin, their guilt is causing them to fail. And so when he says return, well, you can't because you've got sin. Everything you do is a failure. You continue to stumble. You can't turn and, re turn and return to me because if you turn, you're just going to continue to stumble. In other words, something has to happen. And he, In other words, what he's saying is he's telling them a command, return, but you can't, so I'm going to have to do something. Uh, now he says, this is interesting, take with you words... In other words, this is what they're going to bring when they return. They're going to bring words. Uh, it's going to be confession. It, it's going to be an admittance. It's going to be you know, naming Christ. When we get to the New Testament, it's, it's confessing Christ. But take with you words and return to the Lord. And if, again, remember, if they're going to be returning, if there's going to be a return of Israel, it's because the Lord has made a change. It's not because they just got tired of being beat up. They've been beat up before. Remember the book of Judges. It's just this vicious cycle. They come to the Lord. They sin. God sends discipline, or we'll just say punishment. They say, we're sorry. We want to come back. They come back to the Lord. They prosper. They go into sin. And it's like, there's, there's a never-ending cycle. It never stops. For them to actually return and stay is their heart is going to have to be changed. So, take with you words 
and return to the Lord. Say to him, these are the three things. Take away iniquity, or take away our guilt, and then accept what is good. The only thing they can, they've got to bring something with them that is good, and the only thing that's going to be good is nothing from them. It's going to be something God's got to provide. And then this is interesting. The English Standard says, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. It gives the impression that they've made some vows and those vows were a promise of offering sacrifices or bulls. And actually what is being said right there is, is I think I've got something written on the next page. Uh, let's read, let's see, just read the Hebrew. And, uh, oh yeah, there, point three, point three on page two. It says, the Hebrew says that we offer our lips as bullocks or bulls. In other words, what it's actually saying is we're not going to bring sacrifices. Even the, the most expensive sacrifice was a bull. You understand the sacrificial system. The cheapest things were doves and pigeons, and then you go up to lambs and heifers, and eventually a bull. If you brought a bull as a sacrifice, that's, that's like you know, bringing a tractor. It's like it's the most expensive piece of equipment. But anyway, they're not bringing bulls. In, instead of the bulls, they're bringing their lips. So their guilt... They're bringing something good. They're bringing with their lips. It comes right back to returning with words. And the, there's nothing in the words. It's just them confessing what God has done. They, he's returned them. He's restored them. He's given them life. So the Hebrew says that we offer our lips as bullocks, which means instead of sacrifice bulls, we offer our words, our lips. This is not a work of sacrifice, but a confession. In other words, they're done with works. They're done with sacrifice. They're done trying to accomplish anything. Because all those sacrifices, the book of Hebrews makes it very clear, the sacrifices would never do anything. If the sacrifices were effective, the writer of Hebrews, as you know, says, then why did they come back yearly and offer them? If they were really effective, why were they daily sacrifices, annual, annual sacrifices? That means they were, they, were never, they were just a zero. They did nothing except reminded the people of their sin. There's a day coming, and it has come through Christ, where it's done. It's, the sacrifice has been made. The sufficiency of Christ is there. And so when that takes place, there's going to be nothing to bring except words. And the words of your lips are going to be the sacri as sacrifices of bulls. They're going to replace the sacrificial system. And it's not, again, this in the, you know, we talk about lip service and you got to walk the walk, not just talk it, but you got to walk it. That's, that's indeed. You can't just talk about Christianity. You've got to produce it. But this is talking about when they return, what are they going to return with? They've just got to, with their lips, representing what they believe, what they, what they understand as faith, they have to just simply confess, confess Christ. Confess He has done the work. And again, Christ, you know, Jesus, it's not like a magic word. You say Jesus, it's magic. It's Jesus Christ represents all the prophecies that were made from the beginning, uh, what the Lord was going to do, the, the sacrifice He's made, the resurrection, it's all, and to confess, to trust in Jesus Christ is to have some kind of understanding of what took place. It's not just, well, just say the name Jesus. It's like a magic potion. There's, there's power in the name of Jesus because there's power in Jesus, but this lips is going to represent some kind of a uh, 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 understanding, some kind of a, a, a relationship with the Lord through what Jesus Christ has done. And so again, I read it in the English Standard and it, it says, Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to Him, Take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips, or uh, as it says, we will offer our lips as the bulls. Chapter 14, verse 3 there's three things now. Again, here's what they're trusting in. Here, this is what they're trusting in. See this right here? This is what they're coming back with. They're going to return. They're coming back with words, lips, instead of sacrifices. And again, that's not a negative thing. It's not, they're not just lip service. They're actually confessing the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done. And with that, they're going to now identify the things they, they used to trust, they made heirs in. And it says in chapter 14, verse 3, Assyria shall not save us. So again, Assyria... The other nations, and it could also be Egypt or whatever, the nations, international treaties, 
We're not going to trust other nations. That's not our hope. Uh, we will not ride on horses. Again, it doesn't say uh, you know, military, but the idea there is you know, they're not just out joy riding on horses. That's, you know, that's the military. We will not trust in our, 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 our military or any kind of a national military. Scribble there a little bit. And then the last one, or we will no longer say our God to the works of our hands. So the, our works, and again, that's clearly, the works of our hands is clearly talking about idols. But I think it's safe to slip in there sacrifices. Uh, if, it's, if it's not explicit, it's coming right out of the last verse. They're bringing their lips instead, or their words instead of sac sacrificing bulls. So they're no longer going to trust nations. They're not no longer going to trust their own military, their own strength as a nation of Israel. They're no longer going to trust their works of their hands, particularly idols, but even sacrifices is a form of idolatry when you're trusting in sacrifice. The Hebrews makes that clear. If you're trusting in sacrifices instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no longer will they do that. Uh, no longer will they say our God to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. So in other words, they're going back to what they're confessing with their lips, which we would just say the Lord. In our world, we'd say Jesus, but it's the work of the sacrifice. And they've been left, you know, with the destruction of their nation, they've been left as orphans. They have no family, and their only hope is not what they can produce, not a treaty with the nation. They have no military strength. They can only, as orphans, go to the Lord and find mercy. Uh, chapter 14, verse 4. Now God speaks and says, I will heal their apostasy. We've mentioned that already. Heal their apostasy. They've got, to, they've got to be fixed. They can't cure it themselves. And will love them freely. My anger is turned away. So there you've got healing. Uh, you've got forgiveness. And you've got uh, uh, the anger is gone. Anger is taken away. And that is all, excuse me, excuse me, forgiveness. Love. And I give them freely. That would be unconditional love. And that love is in the new covenant now. When we get that out of Jeremiah, the new covenant is Jesus has done the work so they've been healed. There's love in this new covenant. There's, they didn't earn it or deserve it. He's just going to pour it out. And his anger is not just worn out. The anger has been taken care of. The price has been paid. And so this is a wide open road. Now because that has taken place, because of verses uh Chapter 14, verse 2, 3, and 4. We now come to like what we saw before. Now comes the Lord is going to be the dew. Which, again, don't just think of a, a dewy morning. But think of this is like rain, but not like the storms. Like the you know when you have the storm season, you got the, the wadis fill up, the rain comes down. It becomes a flood. We're not talking about a flood. We're talking about dew that is gentle, sets on the plants, and causes growth. This is Yahweh. In this condition, Yahweh is going to be the dew. And it says, I will be like dew to Israel. Again, that's the nation. Dew to the nation of Israel. Again, we, we, you always got to think and be careful. We're not talking about individuals. We're talking about this body of people known as Israel. And in the end, not every Israelite is going to be saved throughout history or preserved their life throughout history. Even in the end times, not every Jew is going to be there and survive, but there's going to be the promise of the nation is going to survive. There will be a nation of Israel. I will be like do to Israel, and here's a whole list of things, and you can imagine what this means. I'll make a few references. They're blossom like the lily. It's blooming and starting to, starting to grow. He shall take roots of the blossom, is the, is the beginning of the fruit. First comes the blossom. We'll just say the flower, which indicates there's fruit coming. And on the other side, you've got roots. The roots are going to be deep. So the deep roots are going to be able to support a lot of branches on the top. The, bigger the, the larger the roots, the bigger the tree. I shall be like dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like, the, like Lebanon. Again, trees of Lebanon is in most translations. They add that, and that's probably fine. Um, again, the key to this, just point three, the key to all of this is the dew. The key to this whole thing 
and this tree, we're going to see, we're going to see shoots coming out. Is that the next? Yeah, right. Chapter 14, verse 6. His shoots shall spread out. And those shoots are not, like if you've got a tree here, these shoots are not in the image, are not like he's a, a small tree, and now those shoots are going to start growing. The idea there is this tree is a dead tree. Kind of like the stump of David. Uh, the dry stump and the root of Jesse comes out. This tree is, in a sense, a dead tree. And all of a sudden, out of this dead tree, new growth. You've gone by, and I just saw one the other day. You know, everybody's cutting down trees. But I saw, you know, you've seen it before. You, you see a stump in someone's yard. You know, they don't cut it all the way down. There's something there, a, a large, you know, the trunk of the tree. But out of the top of it, here comes, you know, the, the green is growing. It's dead. The bark is falling off of it, but yet something's growing. That's the image right here. This nation is dead. It's, it's in, in Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones, dead nation. It's now going to begin because the roots are deep, the fruit's starting to grow, the branches are coming out of this tree, or this, this, this uh, trunk. Uh, his shoots shall spread out, and now it's described, his beauty shall be like the olive, and that's the olive tree, and then his fragrance like Lebanon. And so right there when it says, I mean, it doesn't say tree in the text. It just says Lebanon. But we're talking about the olive, and not, not just an olive. We're talking about the olive tree. And, and Lebanon, I mean, you've got to be talking about the cedars, and that's why everybody just drops that in there. But the olive was, uh, uh, it, it was prosperity. It was, it was oil. It was used for fragrance. It was used for uh, uh, anointing. It was used for cooking. The, the olive was used. It was sold. It made you prosperous. There's so many things, plus it was a, a beautiful tree. So when you see olive, many things came from that. It was like the, one of the staple crops. And so the, the shoots are spreading out, and Israel's going to be like the olive, meaning many things are going to be coming from this. His fragrance, uh, like Lebanon, again, those are the, the cedar trees. If you've smelled cedar or imagine being in a cedar forest, the fragrance, what you see in there is you've got growth, You've got beauty, something that is, is visible and, and uh, tangible, and then you've even got fragrance. So in other words, it's almost like what has taken place here is full, sensual expression in, in a positive way of Israel. Again, there's, we're talking about in the, in the days of the millennium. This is not coming back from Babylonian captivity. This is not even taking place yet today. We, we have a Savior. We are in Christ. We are growing. We can see images here, but we're talking here about a nation being restored and it, it being in a, in a very physical kingdom, if, if you go with that. Uh, chapter 14, verse 7. They shall return and dwell beneath my, my shadow. Now that's where... I'm, well, let's just read the Hebrew right below it on the next page shall return those who dwell under his shadow. They shall be revived. So there are now in this tree, and this tree is clearly the nation of Israel. And this tree now is growing. It's got deep roots. It's got sprouts. It's got flowers that are producing fruit. And clearly there's a shadow. And this is going to be the he or the his. The his shadow is the nation of Israel. Now we're going to have a bunch of they's. A bunch of they's are coming underneath this, in the shadow of this tree. And who are the they's? You could, like I said, this tree is the nation of Israel. The they's could be individual Israelites who are coming to this nation. And now they're in themselves are going to be able to branch out and prosper because of this nation. So goes the nation, so goes the citizens. Thus, make America great again. Uh, sorry. Uh, but nonetheless... If it's not individual Israelites, it can clearly be the Gentiles. And that, that will fit also because when, when Israel prospers, the Gentiles are going to reap the benefits of it. Uh, they're going to come. You know, We even saw when we were going through Isaiah uh, on Monday nights, when the, the king is, when Jesus is in Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom, the nations are going to come to hear him, to ask him questions, to obtain knowledge, and then take it back to their own land. And this would be, again, Israel prospering because the Lord is in the land and the nation's coming. But here it says, uh, His roots shall spread out, I'm in verse 17. They shall return and dwell beneath, the text says, His shadow, which is Israel. 
I think. And again, if you disagree with that, that's, that's fine. They shall flourish, those, those who return, they shall flourish like grain. And that is interesting. I didn't write the notes on that in, in, the, in here, I don't think. I wrote the, what that is saying. They would refer, yeah, I just stuck on that. But that idea is it's uh, uh, they shall flourish like grain. It's like it says they will live like grain. So even you can see it, they shall flourish like the grain. And what that is, seems to be saying, and some commentators are talking about it, is whoever they are, if it's the individuals or if it's the Gentile nations coming, they themselves are going to begin to plant and grow. And almost like the tree is growing now, they're going to be branching out and repeating the process. And they themselves will become planters and, and farmers and growing themselves. Uh, they shall, In other words, it's a tough line of words in the Hebrew. I should have copied that in the notes. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. And again, we're still talking about the they that are in the shadow. Now, if the shadow is the Lord, then they would be Israel, would be famous. Or if Israel is the tree, the individuals or the Gentiles will become famous. It's, they're people of renown. It's going to be, again, a kingdom on the earth that's ab abounding in pros prosperity and recognition. Uh, chapter 14, verse 8 is kind of the closing words of the Lord. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? In other words, again, this, this now, we're done, but now this is Hosea addressing the people of his time in the 730s right here before Samaria goes. Do you see this? Now what, where do idols fit into this? Where, where, where are the idols? God is saying, where how does this even line up with idols? Why would you come over here and make something out of a, a stick or something out of metal when this is what we're talking about? O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am the one who wants to answer you when you repent. I am the one who wants to look after you so you prosper. Idols have no place in this diagram. So, O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. And here's a great verse right here. I am like an evergreen cypress. Now, now the Lord is calling himself a tree. And this goes right back, like I say in John 15. Now the Lord is the tree. And here is the branches right here coming off of him right here. This is, you know, uh, he says right here, I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. In other words, you plug into me, and this would be the individuals, and then here's the fruit coming on those, and this is basically John 15, verse 5, and I think I've got that in the notes there, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, from apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're going to come over here to this idol over here, there's nothing. Or if you're going to break away from the Lord, there's going to be nothing. But if you remain in Him, so again, is Jesus explaining this verse? He could be. Or is Jesus just using a similar imagery? But the truth is, this is the dew, this is the tree, this is the vine, these are the branches, this is where the growth comes from. And if that growth is going to produce fruit. And in our lives, we're, we're growing, we're maturing, and as we mature, we should be producing fruit some kind of fruit, and this fruit is going to be a direct result of coming from the nature of God. So if this is the Lord, this is His character, this is His nature, this fruit should match the tree. If this is an apple tree, the fruit would be apples. Whatever fruit you're producing, it should look like the Lord. Now be careful, it should look like the Lord that you allow the Bible to identify the Lord and not pop culture, including churches. Because churches, you know, you know, like the great, one of the great, if, if Facebook is good for anything, it's good for this one meme. It's like, you know, what would Jesus do? And then the, you know, the meme is like, well, if you ask me what would Jesus do, then we've got to at least leave open the option of turning over all the tables. It's like, you know, what would Jesus do? Well, you know, Jesus would never turn the table. It's like, well, one of the things he did was empty the temple mount and turn over the table. So again, when we say this fruit has to match 
the Lord, you've got to keep all this in the biblical context, not in a pop context. Because the, the world is going to redefine Lord. Well, you, you see it all the time. One of the things I just saw today, and you probably saw it too, was a pastor was you know talking about uh, you know abortion is in line with the character of God. It, it, abortion is something that God would want us to do, and it's like and he was it's like completely you know it, it, for example, if this is abortion. And we're taking care of people. We're helping people. We're being kind to people, meeting people's needs, uh, trying to help make sure their lives, they have their best life, whatever. Abortion does not match this. That would be, well, you know, that's, God cares about people. He's concerned. He wants people to have their best life. He wants them to have their desires met. It's like, no, you're, you're, this fruit is not of the same thing. So in other words, uh, that's, you know, when it says, you bear, you bear much fruit. That fruit should look like the Lord. But he says here, I am the evergreen cypress. Uh, from me comes your fruit. Again, if we're walking with the Lord, that should take place. Now we end with this verse right here. We've mentioned a couple times already. Whoever is wise, and again, these are the person that is wise, who is discerning, and is upright. So the, the wise person, discerning, is upright. You're going to understand these things. This is going to make sense. You're going to be able to receive this. You're going to be able to take this in, apply it to your life, and make it work. Uh, but the transgressors are going to take the very same things, and they're going to stumble. It's not, it's not a matter of the material that's being taught that causes the issue. It's the individual. For example, you know the parable. Jesus talks about the sower goes out to sow the seed. Now, he doesn't tell you four different types of seed. He talks about the road. He talks about the gravel on the side of the road. He talks about the ditch with the weeds in it. And then he talks about the good soil. In fact, the good soil he identifies as 30, 60, or 100 fold of production. So even the soil itself is different. The seed that falls here is the same seed that falls here, is the same seed that falls there, is the same seed that falls in this production, and in this production, and in this production. The seed does not change. The Word is not the determining factor. The Word, the truth, is the seed. It is holy. It is the nature of God. What makes a difference on how the seed produces is this was a road, this was gravel, this was the weeds, the concerns, the worries, and this was soil apparently also changing from 30 to 60 to 100 fold increasing. So the difference in that parable was not the word, but who received it. And that's this parable or this, this last line. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are upright, and the upright will walk in them. But transgressors, what was the problem with the road? That's the transgressor. What was the problem with the seed? The seeds were too shallow. They didn't have the root. They got burned up right away. What was wrong with this? The worries of this life. It was the person that was in error, and that's why the seed did not grow. So again, that's, that's a great way to end the book. In other words, that is, uh, some people would say that that was uh, something Hosea wrote. Others would say an editor put that in as they compiled. And again, that, that's, they did compile the books. It doesn't make it unscriptural. But in other words, it's kind of summing it up. Here's it is. If Hosea put it in there, we'll say Hosea put it in there. But whatever he said, if you understand that, if this makes a difference in your life and you're looking forward to that day of the Lord bringing you restoration, if you know who you are and that you need the Lord to make this thing work, make this life, then you would be the, the wise, the discerning, the one that is upright. If you say, well, I don't understand this, or you stumble on it, it's like, it's, it's, not, it's not Hosea's fault. And that's one reason, I mean, as a Bible teacher, you know, I feel bad, and I, you know, Tony, I, he has to suffer with me, you know, after I get done on Sundays or Mondays, say, well, how did it sound? 
and then she, she's, you know, she listens with the intention of like, okay, I got to hear something so that he said, like, she says, well, I really thought this part was, and, and then sometimes I, I walk out thinking, oh, man, I didn't do a good job. I didn't communicate. I, I, I never made my point. I got off subject. You know, I took too long. I rambled, and I feel bad. You know, and that's, that's something... That, that's something a teacher has to be responsible for. You gotta, you gotta make sure you present it clearly. You gotta be self-judgmental. It's like, am I making it clear? Could I have done a better job? Could I have studied more or whatever? Could I talk faster or cover less material or whatever? But at the end, at the end, at the end of all of it, the Word of God. It is the Word of God. That's why I try to stick with the text, maybe try to explain it, and not try to go over here and make up my own revelation from God, or this is important, this is important in your life. That's fine. Maybe if you're a, a, a pastor or a counselor or a life coach, or you're trying to help someone get out of financial debt, or you're trying to help someone you know, recover from some addiction, or that's, that's all got its place. But we used to call a, a Bible teacher, and you're going to express and explain God's Word, this is what you need to do. You need to teach the Word of God. I try to read it and then just try to, you know, bring it to like, because how, how many times have I read things and it doesn't make sense until I slow down and start to study and draw out of it and all of a sudden it just explodes. And I try to do the same thing. I try to teach the Word, but it's slowed down enough to kind of think about it, let it kind of grow and explode in your understanding. And the Word, now, if, if, if people are positive towards it or if people are negative towards it, that, this is my focus. I cannot be focused on, you know, this, the positive, or this. I mean, if there's 10,000 people cramming in this room trying to hear the Bible class, it's like, wow, it's, it, it, it's, I must be really doing a great job. You can always improve. Uh, maybe I am doing a great job. That's why we've got 10,000 people here. Um, but at the end, it's like, it's the people who are responding to the Word. What happens if there's... Say there's only 10 here. You know, far be it that we'd have a Bible study as small as 10. See, I'm talking to the video camera. No one can see what's going on here. They think, how many people are there? People watch it. They go, I wonder how many people come. Well, hundreds of people. That's right. Yeah, we, we, sometimes we don't even know how many people are here. Um, but it's like, if they don't come, say you've got a, a tiny little Bible study of only 10 people. Uh, it's like, what's wrong? What do I need to change? Nothing. I mean, again, as a Bible teacher, I'm self-critical. What can I do to improve? But I'm not going to change the topic. Well, we could maybe change if I'd start, you know, talking about something else, and maybe we get more. This is a matter of the heart. The people are not responding to the word. Now, again, they may be responding to the word at this church or that Bible study on home online. They may have their own Bible study. It it doesn't mean that. The ideal here is people are responding. This is my job. Our job is to present the truth, present the word, and that people are going to respond to it, or not. And so, you know, there it is right there. It, the, the upright will walk in them, they'll, they'll seek after it, the transgressors, they'll stumble in it. And what do you do with those who are stumbling? Well, you, you keep trying, but ultimately it's, that's not your fault. They're stumbling, or they're rejecting, they're twisting the word, which is well, what they're destined to do. That's what they're going to do. So that ends the book of Hosea. Now, uh, talk to me for a moment uh, and tell me what you think. Um, I'm going to, uh, as of Larry's request, because it, it just it works out. It works out, and uh, and plus it's, it's it's his basement. And so, uh, basement. I meant auditorium. Auditorium. Uh, uh, I, I do want to go through, eventually we got to get to the book of Joel, and as we're going through the sequence of events, or the books that we've gone through, Joel may, some say Joel was the, one of the first ones written, but there's also those who say Joel was one of the last books written. I side with, as far as the sequence of the prophets, one of the things is there's so many repeats in it that either Joel was the first book written, one of the first prophets written, because uh, Isaiah draws from it. Joel or uh, Jeremiah draws from it. You can see all the prophets using information out of Joel and building on it. Or was Joel the last book written and he took from Isaiah? He takes from and he, and he.
details some of the things that have already been presented. The kicker for me is Joel is very has a, spends a lot of time on the Holy Spirit, uh, and he, almost like he's talking almost like in a final sense. So Joel, again, you can disagree with this. I may teach through Joel and disagree with it, but at this point, I seem to think Joel is on the tail end of these prophets where he's, he's con connecting all these points. He's talking about the Holy Spirit manifesting and coming down and kind of like one of the final things, kind of packaging all these things together. So we've got to go through Joel, and that's a very heavy eschatological book that we'll get through. Uh, we also have to go through Habakkuk, uh, which is going to be around the times of Jeremiah. Um, uh, Zephaniah is going to be around the time of Jeremiah. Nahum, you know, just like we had Jonah go save Nineveh, Nahum's going to come and say it's over. Nahum is, is a prophecy to uh, Nineveh or to the Assyrians. And so, just like we see, the Assyrians are now right because Jonah came, Assyria rose, is now is bringing this uh, desolation. Coming after this is going to be Nahum, who's going to come and say, okay, Nineveh, you've served your time, and it's judgment against Nineveh. We've got to cover that book. And then we've got, uh, 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 oh, Obadiah, one chapter. And that comes after the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, and it's Obadiah is now prophesying to Edom. Because Edom was excited that Jacob, his brother, was destroyed, and they are kind of helping, you know, the, the Babylonian spying the, the refugees that were fleeing, and they were thinking, ha ha, our borders are going to now expand because Babylon took out Judah. And Obadiah's like, yeah, you shouldn't be rejoicing about the destruction of your brother. Now you're going to pay the price. So we've got Obadiah that's against Edom, Nahum who's against Nineveh, Habakkuk and Zephaniah who are kind of contemporary, they are contemporaries with Jeremiah. Uh, we've got to go through those. But that's kind of moving into now Judah because Israel's going to fall, and we're done with the northern kingdom. Uh, we could go through Isaiah verse by verse. I do need to do that again. But then we'll move on. So now would be a good time to do a, like a, an end time study. When I say end time study, uh, I'm, I'm building off of last week because we're doing eschatology on Monday nights where we start we're doing extensively. But end times is basically whatever, whatever you're going to make out of it. You know, whatever you want to make out of it. But we talked last week about, you know, the 70th week, you know, the, the midway point, and all of the kind of like the highlights. And one of the themes is going to be the rapture, pre-trib, the, the rapture, mid-trib, before the wrath, but after the seals. And then one that I don't agree with at all is the post-trib, again. And I'll, I'll explain this and teach it. Uh, a lot of it is in Titanic faith. My last position on it is, is Titanic faith, and I'll address that. Um, and we got you know the, the second coming, which is the second coming at the very end right here, or the appearing of the sign of the Son of Man, and the judgments being poured out here with the Lord ultimately coming to the earth in Edom, marching up with the 144,000, and he's making several appearances uh, on different places. Uh, so in a sense, this is the day of the Lord. Now, does that make sense, what I'm saying? You guys seem interested in that? We can do that. Otherwise, my, my agenda is go just keep around going through the prophets. We can take, I don't want to say one week, two weeks, ten weeks. I don't know. It would be like, you know, the thing is, if we don't end it, it could just ramble on. But eventually, well, you can tell because the numbers will drop off drastically. And uh, we'll need to get back to the prophets. So Does that sound like so you'd be interested in that? And I would like to say I've already taught this. I've already got the book. You've got the book. If you don't have the book, take a book. Uh, so I'll just be basically rehashing it. I'll be, I'm always thinking, making corrections. And, and as you're teaching, you know this from your own experience, as you're teaching, sometimes you, you're saying something, and also you realize that this isn't making sense. You know, because it's like you've got these points, and then you, you, you're hammering something home, and also you realize, wait a minute, that, that the, 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 the contradicts this over here. And... You know, so I'm always learning. Even the more I teach, the more I, you know, think about things. And not that I'm not the words are going to change my opinion. But Gail, I don't want to get you out of schedule, so don't. I mean, no. I'm flexible. 
Yeah. Or, well, see, but the thing is, I did think about this. I thought, well, maybe I should just surge ahead, but I figured out how many weeks I'm going to need to finish up the books, and it's going to be like a year. And like I said, this just happened to be a good time because we're, we're done with this and we're going to move in. And so if it's two weeks from now, five weeks from 10 weeks from now, as long as, again, seriously, I, I mean this seriously, as long as you're interested in this. If you like, you know, I've got enough end times, I'm not really interested in it. Because um, I, you know, I, I'm teaching through books, like, for example, Hosea. Wow, you know, again, I'm not sure what you're thinking, but it's possible someone's thinking, you know, Galen is really an expert on the book of Hosea. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's because I just taught through it. I, I got a stack of commentaries and thought, oh my gosh, I have no idea how many chapters are in the book of Hosea. It's like, it just keeps going. And you, you study one chapter ahead. And that's what, that's what I've been done for, you know, many years. It's you just keep, you keep studying. And you're kind of like my guinea pigs. And I pre serious, that's why I say thank you for coming. Because if you, you didn't come, my motivation for study would, would drop off. I'm, I study to teach. Well, that's not a very ethical way of doing it. Well, it's what motivates me. If I know you're coming, well, it's, it's a reason Tony and I sign up for road races throughout our life. We, every, and the older we get, the less we do. But you sign up for 10 or 12 or now one or two road races a year. Why? Why? You think you're going to win? No, I know I've got a race. And so I'm going to run and train because there's this race out there. Well, who cares? No one's going to come and watch. No one even but. It's, it's, it's that person you set a goal and so you got to train for the goal. So I've got Bible study, I've got Bible class which makes me study and so that, I, I do that. So it's not, I'm not you know, an expert on the book of Joel. I'm going to become more of an, have more insight in the book of Joel when we get there because I'm going to study the book of Joel so I can stand up here and talk and make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. And sometimes I walk out and think, I don't think I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. But anyway, so I would like to teach it but I'd more enjoy having questions. Um, again, and understand, if you have a question that, that disagrees, I'm going to justify my position, you know, maybe contradict what you're saying, uh, but not because I, I hate you, but because I, I'm, I'm trying to find the truth. There have been times where I've presented and someone challenges me, and I've, I think it's happened once. And it's like, oh, I might be wrong. I must be wrong. So does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yes, okay, I'm, we'll do that. Are you going to teach out of the Titanic faith? Pretty much the end times. Well, yeah, it's, it's, that's the, I'm not going to teach Titanic faith, that's, you know, the, the whole concept. I mean, I could. Um, but basically, I guess what I'm thinking, what we got interested in last week was this right here. The 70th week. And you know where's this rapture at, and then tie some events in there. Like that could take two weeks, or it could take 30 weeks. And so this one again, my my current beliefs and charts are in Titanic faith, yeah. and that's where it's at. So yeah, I'm going to be teaching the material in Titanic faith. Titanic faith. And again, realize I have stuff online yet. When I was teaching the pre-trib rapture, I've still got the videos and audio. They're still online on my end times. But I also have where you know, you know, where we move before the wrath comes, I, I, and it, it seems to make more sense. So that's all my. <coughs> so I, I'm not I'm not hateful of this. <coughs> I don't think it's necessarily a false teaching. I think it's wrong, and I think this is better. But again, this is still in the mystery, mystery form. We still don't know. So there's going to be. Can you get, can you discuss that? I mean, can you? Just, Seventy weeks. Do you uh, include Daniel as a minor prophet? Um. Yeah. We'll. You mean like when we go through these right here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. I'll stick Daniel in there too. And Zechariah. Yeah, definitely Zach. Yeah, because then Zechariah would be then there with Malachi towards you know after the Persian. So we'll go through the Jeremiah prophets, you know, and then Daniel, and then we'll jump. We'll skip Ezekiel. So I mean, I've, I've taught through Ezekiel. I want I would like to do that again, but I haven't taught the, all these minor prophets. Then we'll jump and do the prophets that come after Daniel, Zechariah, uh, um, Malachi. Uh, would you say? Zechariah. Zechariah, Malachi, and there's one more. Oh, I'm thinking Ezra. But that's not a prophet. But there, there's a, a third one. 
and, and all those those are fun because they're so the, the dates are in those like Daniel dates it, Zechariah dates it, Malachi dates it, Ezekiel started dating it. And that's what's frustrating about some of these books right here is there there's no it's almost it's interesting because as the as the prophets develop because you've got prophets like you know like Elijah and Elisha and even Nathan with David and, and we, where's their material what did you what did you teach what did you say and there's no writing and then all of a sudden you get guys like uh, you know Micah and Amos and they start they're the first ones that actually begin to write down their prophecies they're just now they're just writing them down well then you get through all of those prophets and then you got Isaiah a couple times saying in the year that Uzziah died this happened and Jeremiah sometimes has a date but then Ezekiel I mean, when he has a vision, he tells you, you know, not just the day, he tells you the time of day and what he was doing. And then from that on, then the, they start putting dates on the prophecy. So you can almost see the, the early prophets didn't write anything down, per se. Then the, the prophets in the middle there, they began to write things down, but just kind of a collection. And then Jeremiah, Isaiah, they started sometimes dropping a date in there. And then by Ezekiel's time, they're dating every chapter, which as a teacher is very... Because you can, you can, you you got your footnotes. When Ezekiel says in this day, it tells you it's September twenty second, you know, in the year. So okay, I'll quit. Um, yeah, we'll do Daniel when we come back. Any other questions? And I know that's dangerous because I'll talk for another half hour. I will pray and then we will leave. Father, we do thank you again for the chance to look into your word. We thank you for being faithful to us. We ask that by the power of your Spirit, the Word that lives within us, and the life you've given to us, that we would walk faithfully to you, towards you and produce the fruit that you've called us to. We do ask that we would stay faithful to the name of Jesus Christ and his character in our lives and the things we do. We do thank you again for this grace and mercy and ask that we may see revival in our day, in our churches and in our nation, in our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for your patience.